Um, so let's see. Did this actually work? Is learning worth is learning Rust worth it in the current year? I don't know. It kind of depends, I guess. I think learning Rust is generally one of the most useful things you can do, just because I think it teaches you way better programming skills than most other languages, and it forces you to do better designs um, when you write software, and it also has some positive impact on programming in other languages. The only downside is that very often it kind of spoils other languages for you um, because you start to realize what terrible things we as programmers kind of write normally in other languages. Uh, Rust is, I think, is overall a very good way to learn better programming. And I don't think it's very hard to learn. Um, it the, It's only hard to learn if you think that um, basically, it's hard to learn if you try to do the same things as you would do in another language. For instance, it's very hard to build a linked list. And Rust tells you from the start, don't do that. Um, just learn, I guess, the ideas of, of why it's interesting to run in Rust at the same time. And there are a lot of really good libraries you can use to have some good experience um, in the beginning. Uh, Python 2 or 3, uh, whatever works for you. What would you like to achieve in 2019? And what are my biggest concerns? Uh, biggest concerns, I think, would be more of a political thing. I don't know. There's some really stupid stuff going on in Europe with and the United States with politics, so this could all get just worse. What I would like to achieve in 2019, uh, I have some projects I want to do. Also, the we have an um, around pallets. So the previous there was a there were the Baku projects, Flask, Werkzeug, Jinja, and so forth. And there's a new organization around it now called Pallets, which uh, can actually be donated to via the Python Software Foundation. And my goal, in a way, is to make sure that Pallets works better this year than it did last year. So to make it possible for people to donate and to have a better um, funding model for Flask and the other libraries. Uh, I didn't have any inspiration to create Flask in the sense that there was nothing that told me I should do it. It's just, um, I don't know, I just liked, I had already my PHP, as uh, my PHP, I had already my Python web libraries and I just wanted to do um, a small framework around them. There were a lot of people at the time re-implementing in their own frameworks, uh, WSGI, HTTP, and all of those um, basic protocols, and I already had something. So I wanted to show that you can actually build a framework around. Uh, if you already know a lot of Python, but you don't know Rust, how would you get started to make Rust useful? Um, I mean, the obvious answer is extension modules. So the the main thing um, that Rust is really useful for, if you have no other use cases, is either building extension modules for Node or WebAssembly or for Python, or to build command line applications. Uh, it's very good for building command line applications because you can distribute them to users and they don't have to have the right version of Python installed or Node or anything like this. So you get just one binary, they can run it. Um, so if you if you have like little things you want to build on a command line, then Rust is very useful. Um, so the for instance for Sentry, the company I work for, our command line utility is written in Rust. Um, there are a lot of programs like Bat which are written in Rust. So there's like uh, there's a program that just 
syntax highlights and gives you a, like a nice output. A lot of these really useful ones are at this at this point either written in Go or Rust. Um, so that's a good use case for it. Will there be a conference in Russia in the future? Yeah, probably. Um, in what spheres do you prefer using Rust? Uh, network services, I think, is a big one. Um, anything parsing related, I think. Generally, I, I like to use Rust for a lot of um, data modifying and, uh, and, and little web services, command line applications. Do you feel sufficient challenge uh, be writing Python? I don't understand the question. Uh, here, cut Jimmy. What's my thoughts on serverless? Um, someone mentioned the other day serverless is just CGI bin in 2019, so I think this is a pretty good description. It's, it's a very convenient way to write small little services that are relatively stateless. So fine by me. Uh, when will you port all palace projects to Rust? I'm not porting the palace projects, um, but I do write a lot of things in Rust now that are replacing some of the Python things. Um, for, I, I don't plan on writing a click for Rust. Um, I'm using a thing called structopt, which works really well. Um, so I can actually show an example here. Uh, this is a library. Uh, I can close this. Uh, this is a library uh, I wrote for, or this is actually a program for. Um, this is one of the recent programs I wrote in Rust. Um, and the command line application is, is, I mean, it's not click obviously, so it works different, but a lot of the ideas are somewhat similar. So just define what it is that you want. Um, so for instance, yeah, I want a long argument named manifest path, value name is path and so forth. And it gives you, um, cargo instance. so this is one of my programs and it gives you sub commands and everything. So it's not click, but it's similar enough. They don't have to write something like click for rust. Um, but there's no good web framework right now that's small other than Rocket, which requires nightly or relatively complex like Actix Web. So maybe I will build something at one point that's sort of similar to this, but I, I don't think I will point any of my Python libraries. Um, how do I, well, hold on. what's the status H theme? Um, there's a repository on GitHub on my name called dot files for all my status H stuff is. Was um, how do I approach API design? Uh, chaos driven development. Try to use it as long until actually. So click, I think, is one of the better examples because they actually had a process which was I made the documentation while I was writing the library, and so a lot of the examples that I made, I discovered that the API doesn't work, and then I changed it. Um, so uh, this is, I think, is a, is a good way. If, if you want to make a good uh, user-friendly API documentation, writing while you're doing the API design tells you immediately when it's crappy to use. Um, and I have some ideas generally that I try to follow for API design. Um, but API design is hard. Um, one of the more recent cases of where I was involved in API design was the um, where the new Sentry SDKs, and they underwent many months of various painful rediscovery about what you can do and what you can't do. Um, so it's there is no consistent response, I guess that I can give. So this stream I do record separately, and I will also upload. I also recorded the previous streams, but I'm not sure if I'm going to upload them. Um, we'll see. I would need to cut it down because of the way I recorded it. Uh, I don't have the video on demand saving enabled on Twitch because I think it only lasts for 30 days. Will WebAssembly have a bigger impact than serverless? I don't know what impact serverless has. I know that WebAssembly will have a big one. Uh, so I can't just, I can't guess how it is compared to serverless, but I think WebAssembly is, is going to be massive. Um, in particular, I think WebAssembly is going to become the way we distribute 
anything, not just on the web. Like I, I didn't do it yet, but I wanted to build a library for Python where you can load WebAssembly code. And there's a lot of stuff that you need to do to make it possible. But overall, I think we will start to distribute binary extensions as WebAssembly. How to study in university effectively? I don't know because I didn't finish my university. Um, thoughts on decentralization? I think it's a terrible idea. I would strongly recommend not to decentralize things. Makes everything harder. Not a huge fan. Good books to read on API design. Um, I don't know on top of my head, but I did read a few. But it's already so many years back that I can't remember what they were actually called. Um, Rust like simple web frameworks. Do you see warp? Yeah, I did see warp, but it seemed like the entire opposite of a simple web framework. Um, it, I don't know. Um, I think it's cool. I just don't understand how I would use it. So the most success I had with web frameworks in Rust so far have been Rocket, although I didn't actually build anything with it that was long lasting. Um, and Actix Web, which we use at Century. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I would just upload the recordings to YouTube other than, um, I, I don't know how to do the Twitch thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I will, I will definitely upload it to my YouTube channel though afterwards. Um, Uh, what do you think about the new types of async web frameworks in Python? See, the problem is that I don't do that much in Python anymore. That or my Python usage is kind of stuck ten years ago in a way. Sentry is on two point seven. Uh, we don't have a lot of async stuff there. Um, a lot of the new things we are writing are not really that Python heavy, um, and. I don't have a lot of trust in the interpreter design internally that I think async would have a good future in Python. That's why a lot of the use cases that people have for async, I'm not trying out. Um, the, the, the whole overall async story in Python thing is getting better, but it's really held back by the overall chaotic language design and sort of internal interpreter design. There's a lot of stuff that landed in Python 3 I strongly disagree with. Um, and so I don't feel as confident with that having a future. Um, overall, async IO, I wish we would not have async IO. I'm, I, I'm not just in Python. I think overall, the way, or at least I, I don't mind asynchronous IO. Um, that would actually be great. We have a lot of languages that don't, even operating systems where the basic primitives for async IO don't work. Um, you can't open an async file handle on Linux, for instance, uh, or at least nobody implements it that way. I think there's theoretical support for asynchronous IO, uh, but practically everybody has a thread pool and does IO there. Um, from the await, async await story, I wish we would just have threads. I think overall it's a better thing, um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's always going to be async IO, so, or async await is always going to be there. I just, I think it makes for some very potentially dangerous code. It lets you do certain things very easily that I don't think should be easy. Um, I did not try closure for anything other than a weekend. I don't like the JVM. If I can avoid it, I will not use the JVM. Uh, I did use F-sharp though, which I really liked. Uh, large disagreements with Python 3 features. The problem is that I don't think you can make a better Python story with the current development cycle. So the reason I like the Rust development cycle is because every six weeks there's a new release. So stuff lands very quickly. A lot of people are trying it out and you can immediately see when it's a bad idea and it will be killed off and it will be replaced by another implementation. Python is one and a half years, I think, release cycles and new features just land and then are there. And you can't get a feature right on the first attempt. So a lot of things landed in Python 3, which are not sufficiently broken, but also just not in a good state that I feel it's good. Typing is a good thing, um, good example there. I don't think that the way the type system works in Python 3 is any good, um, but we're kind of stuck with it now and it's just halfway implemented. 
Async IO landed in a really terrible shape. I think it's much better now, but at the time it was not very good. Um, the Unicode support in Python 3, I don't like. I think it should have been differently done. So there's just a lot of stuff in Python 3 that takes too long to mature. Um, I don't like triple dot for post fix await uh, as an operator. So there was a question that's like, help me to push for the post fix dot 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 operator for await. I think it should be at, I think it's possible. If it collides with something else, then I think there might be other characters that could be used. Uh, but I really like the idea of at as a post fix await. And I do like the idea of post fix await. So the, the, the a lot of languages where you do await foo, uh, like in Python, JavaScript and so forth, and in Rust, they're proposing to do something like this, to await. And I actually like that because that lets you chain a lot of things like operator access and stuff. Um, what do you think of a trial library? I, I mean, I didn't use a lot of async IO. The only async IO on Python 3 that I used was Curio and async IO, uh, and I kind of only used async IO properly. How do you deal with burnout on projects of GitHub? Uh, mark all notifications as red and just not do it. The problem is I don't do a good job at project maintenance, uh, so I should not be an uh, example here. Um, I mean, I, I just like when I feel overwhelmed by stuff, I just ignore people. That's sort of my response. Why Rust instead of Go? Um, I think Rust is a stronger language and it I found it exciting when I first used it. And when I first used Rust, I don't know if it was before or after Go, but I used it very early on. I used it when it still looked a lot more like Ruby. Um, so it didn't have for loops, for instance, it had like an each um, method on on collections and stuff like that. Um, and I just, I found it really exciting. A lot of the ideas of Rust excited me. Um, Go, I felt, I found it curious, but not novel enough that I found it interesting. How do I like Haskell? I think I'm too, I think Haskell is too complex for me. Um, so I think there's a lot of, the, the problem with is, there's a there's a lot of discussion currently in the Rust ecosystem about stabilizing async await, and the biggest problem I guess with stabilizing async await is that a lot of the ecosystem for async await in Rust is stuck on a very old version of the futures library, and the new async await system, due to how it ha has to deal with uh, certain details about uh, borrowing um, data make it impossible to many implement. And so the reason async await is stuck is I don't think it's a syntax conversation. I think the main reason it's stuck is because none of the ecosystem will move until async await syntax is stable because nobody wants to implement these new features manually. Um, I think it could absolutely be stabilized with a macro though. I think there could be a temporary await macro um, and then it could be after the fact the syntax could be picked. Um, also, the other thing is like, so one of the reasons I really, really like Rust has absolutely nothing to do with the language, but with, it reminds me of how I felt about Python when I started to do Python. I found it hugely exciting. It was an open source project. At the time, Rust was, uh, Python was really good at getting people into the project. Like I could contribute to Python at the time and it was very easy to do. And Rust does that. Rust is a very strong community around it. Um, and so that that's also one of the reasons why I really like Rust uh, because you can actually, you can participate in it. Uh, yeah. I think the problem is like comparing Rust and Python overall, uh, since there's a question about what's more pleasant data processing pipelines in Rust or Python is that they're very, very different. I So the thing is, I, I think Rust is a very suboptimal replacement for Python and it can't be that for me. Um, it's just some things that can overlap in Python and Rust. The problem is I don't have a better language than Python for things that Python is good at. So a lot of, 
manual data processing for like one time use, I do in Python. But I wish there was a language that's sort of a, a new version of Python, like a, a from scratch implementation of Python that doesn't have any of the downsides and is sufficiently compatible with Python that you could leverage the ecosystem a little bit. That would be great if we could have that. Um, but nobody built that yet. Ideally, someone would build something like a TypeScript version of Python based on a modern runtime that's interop uh, in, that has some built-in interop with JavaScript and Python through some, I don't know, maybe inter-process communication, something like that. I would love for there to be another language that's not JavaScript that I enjoy using that's dynamic. But right now it's, I'm kind of stuck with Python. Um, overall, I think a lot of data processing is more fun in Rust, but the slow iteration cycles in Rust are not great. But it's more fun in Rust because of um, the strong typing. Um, how is Rust tooling compared to Python? That's the thing, Rust tooling is leaps and bounds ahead of Python. And primarily because the Rust tooling is written by the core Rust community. And a lot of the tooling in Python is written by other people that have nothing to do with Python. The packaging ecosystem in Python is not by the Python developers. The IDE experience is not by the Python developers. Um, the debugging stuff is not written by the Python developers. The package index, at least at this point, is kind of in within the reach of the Python core developers. But a lot of what people use around Python is built by other people. And the thing with Rust is you install Rust and all the tools come with the same distribution. I, I download Rust and there's a there's an NVM thing called Rustup, which gives me multiple versions of Rust. There's a built-in packaging tool, built-in test suite, test runner, all that stuff comes out of the box. And it's every six weeks it updates. It's written by the same people. It's just a way more coherent experience. No, I can absolutely not bang out the Point, uh, a proof of concept as fast in Rust as I can in Python. A lot of things I start doing in Python as an experiment and then try to do it in Rust afterwards. It's very hard to be productive in Rust. You pay, the, the, the compiler is way too slow. I think that's the, the biggest challenge. Um, it takes a long time for you to be as quick in testing something. But then it's also very hard to maintain Python projects over a certain size or you run into other issues. Um, so at one point, Rust becomes more productive. Um, yeah. What about MyPy? MyPy, I think it made some not super good decisions about typing because it tried to be compatible with Python. Um, and TypeScript did a better idea there because TypeScript is incompatible to JavaScript in the sense that all of the TypeScript syntax does not work in JavaScript, or at least didn't at the time. So they were free to explore and use a transpiler to produce JavaScript code. I think typing in Python should have been that. If Rust exists on my side, no, I would never have avoided Python because Python is great as a language. It's just, it, I, I don't know. It just didn't make the best decisions at one point. Um, and now it is just a lot of stuff in that language and not all the things are of the same quality. And there's just too much language in there to, to like there's too much stuff in Python to ever have many other implementations. And that's probably also true for Rust because Rust also has a lot of stuff in there. It's very hard to make a language specification around. Um, but I think the Rust core is, is in a better shape than the Python core. Um, thoughts on the Python governance model. I think the new government model is a much is an improvement over having one person at the top. Um, but I also don't know for sure. Um, I, I think Python needs much quicker development cycles. That's that's the main problem, and it needs some sort of roadmaps, maybe OKR, something like that, where it's like in Q one of this year we're going to tackle packaging or something like that. That's what Rust does. Rust decides every year what they want to do um, and sort of they follow on this story. 
So last year they, they worked very hard on command line tools um, on the 2018 edition of the language. So there's a lot of stuff they had on the roadmap and they, they tried very hard to deliver on that. Um, and a lot of other languages don't do that. Python for sure doesn't. Um, uh, I don't think it's a, I don't know. I don't know whatever the agile development means in that case, or the agile environment means in that case. I think you can be very productive in Rust, but you can't make a prototype as quick as you can do one in Python. Because you can do a lot of things in Python that just would not work in Rust because there are no types, so it, all of that stuff falls away. Um, you don't have to compile anything. But you're like you can make a lot of crappy code in Python very quickly to test something. Uh, but it's going to be a problem afterwards. Um, do you think compile time in Rust will compete with other languages? But I hope so. I I don't see a reason why Rust has to be this slow to compile. Um, I mean, like right now, there's some decisions made in language that make compiling it fast problematic. But overall, you can absolutely make it compile faster. Um, no, I did not build Paramico. Someone else did, but I used it for a long time. Um, actually, I wonder who did the Paramount mm. account. I think I know the developer of it. Oh, yeah, BitProfits was the one who built it, I think. Yeah, I'm very happy when people use my libraries. And I, I think it's still a good idea to use Python. It's just a lot of my problems moved away from that ecosystem so that I feel much more at home now in, in Rust. But I, I still hope, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think Python is in a good direction now, especially with the new leadership. And I think it's on a it's on a different path now anyways, because it goes into data science, it goes into a lot of mathematics. So there is there might actually be some commercial backing now that shapes the language in, in, a, good, in a good direction. For instance, uh, Jupyter Notebook is great. And I think the company behind that has is trying to exercise a little bit of uh, of control of the language is going to be good. What's your likely stack for web development in twenty nineteen? Uh, front end React probably. God knows which all the libraries that fit into it. That too many that you need, uh, but yeah, front end will probably be JavaScript with React. And backend, I don't know, depends. Definitely GraphQL, I think. I'm a huge, I'm very happy with how GraphQL works. So probably Apollo and React on the front end. Um, backend is tricky because GraphQL backends are still not very good. You can, a lot of the, there's a lot of stuff you would need to do in GraphQL to make it work really well. And a lot of systems don't support that. Um, so you would, there's the access control issue, there's the problem with, scaling it. Um, there's just a lot of stuff that needs to be done to make GraphQL work really well on the backend. And so I don't know what a good service is to do that. Do we do test-driven development? Sometimes, most of the time I don't. I'm not a huge fan of that. I have not used the dgraph database, whatever that is. My thoughts on the controversy surrounding pipenv. Um, so Python packaging in a nutshell is there's pip, which on the fly monkey patches setup tools, which on the fly monkey patches dist utils, which is a very, very old system. So we have three layers of stuff on top. Um, and dist utils is just a hack to work with the Python input system. So pip and as far as I can tell is just another thing on top of all of this. Ideally, Python packaging would just be fixed on the very first level. Like the import system can already be the packaging system. There's nothing that needs to be done overall to, uh, we don't need that many tools in theory. Um, so I think 
it doesn't matter like if someone builds another pip end version uh, this needs to be fixed in the language um faults on um it's always better to be a polyglot rather than specializing in a language i think i don't have any faults on poetry either I honestly like Python packaging frustrates me so much that I don't want to think about it. I just I try to pretend that it's not a problem. That's my solution to all of this. I Python packaging cannot be solved unless it's solved in the language. Like any attempt to solve it outside just does not work. So I will I will ignore any new tool uh, because it's all going to be the same. Nobody can fix it at that level. It needs to be fixed in a language. Um, pip is the slowest thing ever. I don't think pip is the slowest thing. I for sure npm before five was way slower at pip than pip for installing anything. Uh, so it's not the slowest package manager. Um, yeah, I don't know. So let me know if I should actually program something else or if we should stay with the Q and A thing. And what? Um, Pet one seventeen. Is that the one that? Hold on, I think I saw this one. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know if Pep. 17 is the one, hold on. I don't think PEP uh, 517 and 18 are going to be the solution for this. There is, however, a PEP. I think there was a PEP. Either there's a PEP or there is um there was a mention on the mailing list at one point to um to make Python import from a local path automatically without the virtual env. Um but I don't know which one it was. Uh, uh, I don't actually know. Python input system is complex. But I guess Python should just do the same thing as Notas, import locally. That would be great. Um, when the code something, could you show a hello world example of Python calling Rust? Yeah, I want to do that. Um, do you use OS packaging formats like .dep or RPM or Docker? Uh, I don't make Debian packages ever. I do use Docker. Um, I think I would probably use Docker. Yeah, we, we will build Docker images for most stuff, for sure. I'd like to hack on the Rust CLI program. You can do some, some, uh, let's see. Yeah, PEP582, that's the one that I meant. Python local package directory, that's the one. I'm, I have some hopes on that being some start of some fixing. Um, yeah, that's the PEP packages one. I think that's a, that's a good idea. Um, it's still a draft. I don't know why that is a draft. That should be already accepted. To be honest, I think that's a yeah. That that, that pep has all my support. Five eight two, local packages directory. Um. Okay, let's do let's do the following. Uh, let's do um, let's do some Rust and Python um together. I think there's some stuff that can be done. Uh, let's see. What's a good thing to do? I think. So the best alternative for click in Rust is struct opt. Um, and I'm probably going to use that one for whatever I'm going to build now. Um, oh yeah, there's actually one thing I wanted to build. I wanted to build. Um, I wanted to build something like JQ. Um, so there's this program called JQ, where you can do this. And you can say, I don't actually know how it works. I think you do um, 
Yeah, so you can do this. You can basically subselect into dictionaries. Um, so you can do this. And I guess you can do... How does it work? I think you can make it somehow... Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. You can do this. Yes. So this is this is a quite a nice thing. Um, and I wish I could do this for YAML too. Um, check your lectures and query, yeah. Um, basically what I wanted to do already at one point is I have this library in Rust called Insta, um, which is a snapshotting library. And it looks roughly like this. Let me demonstrate this. Hello. Okay. Um, So I have this project here, um, and the way it works is you have snapshot tests. Like this is a test that has a vector from zero to four. Let's make a vector from zero to six. So it's just going to be like a range to six. Um, and if I run the tests, yeah. so if I run this, I don't know why it recompiles everything. Uh, shouldn't do that. But basically, the problem is with a snapshot test, it snapshots everything. So a snapshot test takes a structure, serializes it out, and then whenever you run the test, it compares it against that. And that means that whenever you have something in your structure that changes all the time, then uh, you need to remove that part from the snapshot. So if you have the current time, for instance, in your snapshot, then it will always uh, spike. Um, so if you have the current path in it always, uh, sorry, the current path, if you have the current time in it always, then the snapshots will always fail. Um, so I wanted to do something where you can define something like with JQ a path which you remove from the from the snapshot. Um, so this is this finds this the snapshot that uh, changed. So before the snapshot looked like this, one two three, and the new run also has four and five in it, and I have this cargo insta review which will tell me uh snapshot change they want to accept it and if i do uh, if i run it again snapshot work but if i have for instance a snapshot test which returns the current time in it then it will always be different so i was thinking of building something in rust where i can parse something like a gq path so that I can do um, a theoretical snapshot test where I can say, well, I want to do the same thing. I want that this snapshot matches my reference value. But in addition, I also want to have something like the current timestamp. So if the reference value would be, for instance, timestamp, and this is going to be current time, it's obviously not the current time, but something like this, and have some other value. Um, then I would like to say, okay, if the timestamp is like a certain thing, then I want it to become 42. And then the snapshot would actually, or actually I would do something like timestamp. And so then the snapshot would actually be like this. So this is what I want the snapshots to be. Um, and so on this side, it would probably be a JQ expression. Um, I wanted to build that. But I'm not sure if that's a good thing to do in a stream. Um, I have no opinions on PEP 572, the operator thing. Um, yeah, anyways, so. I'm not going to do that for sure, um, but I was thinking of making a little command line application where I can test something like JQ in it. So, um, so the goal would be to build something like JQ probably, but for now um, it could be something simpler, which is just going to be uh, a simplified version of JQ that can also deal with other formats. Um, so let's try that. But it needs a name. Um, what could it be called? And we can also export that to Python. So we can actually run the same thing in Python if we want. Uh, 
let's see. Uh, let's call it. So it would be like JQ, but it also works with other formats. YQ. I don't I want it to be like, um, I don't know. For now, I'm just calling QQ, and I hope that nobody uses that yet. No, yeah, so. Uh, let's just start with this. Um, so I probably want two things here, uh, a program and then a library independent that I can export the library to Python. Um, but let's see. Am I going to create an internal format? Yes, probably. So I don't have to create one because there's already one. So let's start with a simple one. Um, so when one starts a new Rust project now with cargo new, it automatically opts you into the current version of the language and puts some stuff in there. Um, so what we probably want is this thing, 30, which is a serialization library. Then we want the JSON one. We want the YAML one. I also probably want the TOML one. And I think it's just called TOML. Yes, I think that's the one. And I probably want 30 value. Um, and 30 value is actually the more interesting one in this case. Um, because 30 value lets you deserialize some external data into some reusable internal format that you can then sh ship out again. Um, and then I'm going to add struct up, which is the library for command line things. So I think we have all the libraries now. Um, okay, so this is how this usually works, um, for me at least. I, I usually have a main function here in which I'm going to use... Um, so I have my app somewhere here, let's call it CLI, and then I'm going to do, I'm going to call execute on my uh, on the CLI module. It doesn't exist yet. And if it returns an error, then I'm going to print um, std, std error. Um, error. Hey, I can't type here. Still not used to this editor. Um, error and then my error so this, is, this should be enough and then if it's okay then actually i can do this i can do if let air air equals this then i'm going to write this and i'm going to do std process exit one so now we just need to write this module um and it's going to return a result of nothing and ah and i'm going to use Failure cargo at failure. For command line applications, failure is great. So I can do use failure error, and that just represents any type of error that can come. And I'm just going to return nothing for now. So this, if I run it, does absolutely nothing. My VS code and not Vim. My VS code is configured like a Vim, so it's close enough. Um, I still use Vim for most of my things though, but I'm making an effort in trying to learn. I uh, trying to use VS Code a lot recently. Um, uh, is ePrint not a thing yet? Actually, I think there might be like a. a, a then I'm pretty sure there is some sort of. Let me see. Uh, Chrome. I think there is something like. Uh, let's start. I think there's a printer and that can do two e printer um, right? Two standard error. Yeah, let's use this one. Uh, e printer Look at this. Beautiful. Uh, so there's still an error. Why is it an error? Function is private. Let's publicify it. Pub cargo one. Okay, so it doesn't do anything. Perfect. Uh, so if you print something here then we'll see stuff okay perfect so now we need the app uh, and so we use struct opt struct opt and we can do derive struct opt and debug so this will implement 
destruct up trait and debug. Debug is great because it lets you automatically print out the state of something. So if I make a struct here, uh, I think it's called opts or whatever you want to call it. Um, we can now put arguments on there. So one of them we'll probably call format and value name, actually, let me check this. Value name is format. And then I think it has to be format is option format. And then we do pop in on format. And I don't actually know if this works in up, So let's see. I don't know if you can make arbitrary enums. Let's see. Uh, enum, 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 enum. Can you do like. Bum, 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 bum. I wanted to have like an option of like value one, two, or three. Uh, I guess you can do this. Let's try. So we derive struct up and debug format is um, YAML, JSON, Tomble, which is going to be this for now. Uh, and then I think we need to do, what does it say? Format from stir is not implemented for format. Huh. Is this really not working? Uh, by the way, there is consensus on using Rust format. I'm going to enable this now because um, I didn't do it for this workspace yet. Format on save. Okay. Uh, so this one doesn't work, so I'm going to just do a string for now. Um, I don't know how to make it one of this. But I can do opts is opts from args, I think it's called. I don't know why it doesn't auto complete. Oh, I guess I'm going to do this. And if I do uh, format with a question mark, then it's going to print me out everything. So if I run it with format YAML, then it tells me it's YAML. But I still want to see if I can actually do enums. So let's see, struct opt enums. Enum handling. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Nothing fancy. Derive these here, guys. I mean, I can do that. Surely there must be a better way to do it. Strum into enum iterator. Arc enum, what's that? Clap arc enum. Uh, our genome. Okay, let's try this one. It seems a little bit absurd to do this, but clap. Let's do clap. Use clap our genome. Then our genome. Uh, derive debug. What else do we need? Let's do partial cure. So pops in on format YAML, Tommel, JSON format. Oops, I got that. Cannot find my club count experts. Ah, uh, it's because this is still an old library that doesn't automatically import the other ones. Okay, but this works, so if I write something else tells me it's not a valid value. But this is weird. What does it actually do here? Okay, this is dissatisfying. There must be a better way to do this. Uh, yeah, I will put the video on demands uh, on YouTube. Okay, so I don't like this one here. Let's see if there's a better way to do it. Um, OK, 
Okay, maybe this makes it better. Let's try. Um, so possible values is this one. Uh, format variance. This is not great. So this is one problem in this library that needs to be solved. Uh, does this work even? I wonder if it can possibly be this raw. I don't know. Maybe it's just like this. Expected slice from stream. Ah, I think it's like this now. It changed something. Okay, yeah. Uh, except this is uppercase now. I don't like that. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I need to find a better um, microphone setup. This one is just too crappy. If I don't talk, it will increase the uh, the gain and then it will feed in the the noise from the laptop. Um, so the problem is it doesn't really show me the arguments in a nice way. It will show me bar bad quads as capitalized. I don't want that. Okay, I don't want to get held up on this. I will leave it for now with this. Uh, but I do want to set it to lowercase, which uh, it's highly recommended to use this. Let's try raw case insensitive because true i guess like this let's see okay so if i do a format yaml it should work okay so this works um what other arguments do i need i need the file which i want to read i'm going to call this um, but don't actually want to take this. Um, so this is the format of the input data. Otherwise, default is guessing. Um, and this will be the name and the file to open or stand it in. Uh, so path buff is, um, it's like in Python, there's a path type. So this one is the same, um, it's just not to import it. So, so I can do a file. Um, so the name of the file will be this. Okay. Um, there's an open issue on this with the PRI and clap and have a derived maker. Yeah, it would be great if that would be something better than this, because this one kind of is frustrating right now. Um, to be honest, I think the, the problem is like this should actually be something that is in the language, I almost feel like, um, to have... There's so many libraries to work with enums a little bit, um, so it would be better if that was something built in. Uh, okay, so this is the... We should actually call this input format because we also want the output format, which will be the same. Um, and the output format uh, will be also implied, but defaults input format. Okay. So let's call this input format. So I'll give it a short name too. Um, and I guess you do it like this. So short is I, and short is, uh, let's do F and F. Does this work? So let's do, why is input format not working? So what does it say now? It says, well, it says underscores. This is weird. Okay, I'm going to do input format and output format. This to me appears to be a bug. Um, 
So we want to go from Cham Jason to YAML. Okay, on test file Jason. Okay, so now let's make a test file. Uh, here outside. So we have full bar la string. Um, okay. Yeah, so the 30 thing does exist. Um, but it's not great yet. Um, because the problem with 30 is that this rename rule only applies to serializers, deserializers, and this is not what clap is using. Clap is using uh, the from string trait. And so it doesn't implement it. Um, but it doesn't matter. This is good enough. Okay, so now we need to read everything into some data. So we can use 30 value value. I think there's value and then from okay, just do a value. And then we need all the other 30 libraries. So YAML, we use Toml, we use JSON. And so let's make a function here called um, deserialize. Input is some bytes, I think. Yeah, and format, format. I think that's the best way for it now. And return a value. Uh, so match format. Uh, if the format is JSON, then we use 30. Actually, to the result. Yeah. So return 30 JSON from slice. Sorry, from slice uh, input. Then YAML is the same. And I guess Tomba is also the same. Let's see. Does this compile? Maybe that's just called Tomo, I think. Okay, so let's print. So let's do match opts uh, dot file. If the file is some uh, just a dash or nothing, then it's std uh, std in read I will read use in and read and I think I don't actually know if you need to buffer this probably not so let's try read to I think it's called read all let's see IO read and the method is called read to end. Oh, this is actually annoying. Isn't that like a simpler one? Eh, doesn't matter. So let me buff is like new. Buff. Um, yeah. Okay, and then we do. Buff. Otherwise, we open the file. And there's a nice method for this in the SF module. FS read. I think just called read. Um, file name. Okay, so now we have the contents. And now we do parsed is deserialize contents and format. And this is uh, opts format unwrap or so for now I'm just going to default it to JSON. And I'm going to debug print this. So 
not found. Oh, it's STB and SVN, I think. Oops. I think there's a better way to do this. Just um, no SDN. Let's see why is SDN. IO, I was IO. So then I don't know what was wrong. Uh, okay, 59. Okay, I do s ref map x and then store. This is kind of ugly. I'm pretty sure there's a better way to do this. Okay, what's the better way to do this? Um, I'm just going to not do this for now. Read all because I think you need to do this in lock. What to do with this? You lock it and then you can read from it, I thought. So why can I not read? Um, okay, this is input format, so it's script. But why does this one not work? Um, Oh, read to end, that's what it's called. Okay, perfect. So now we just need to slice this. Okay, perfect. So you can read the JSON file and you can spit it out. Uh, and now we want to format it back into something else. So we do serialize parsed into ops output format unwrap or format JSON. Uh, output is, and then we print it. So we do the same thing the other way around. So we serialize a value into this format, and we return a string, I think, because all of our formats are Unicode. So let's do um, 30 yes, okay. format JSON, 30 JSON serialize to string pretty. I think we're going to make it always pretty. It's pretty for now. So pretty means indented. Um, so we have JSON, then we have YAML, which is always pretty. And Tom, um, which is always the same. There is no non-pretty version of Tom. And this one consumes this. Uh, actually, makes no sense. Look at this. Um, and I need to make this. And I need to make this. So a question mark always does the error handling. So now it reads. JSON and spits out YAML or Tomer or JSON again. But I believe it destroys the ordering. Yes, so let's fix the ordering. There's actually a feature on so the JSON which can be turned on, which is called preserve order. And I think with this, it should automatically retain the original order. But it doesn't. I have a suspicion that the value type does not support ordering because its map is a B tree map, which destroys the order. I wonder if there's 
a flag on this to change it. Please, 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 please. No. Hmm. But so this is one of the nice things in Rust. So we can fork this now. And clone this. So let's fix someone else's code. Git clone. We do git github.com. Let's see we call set value. And let's add support for ordering. So we add a new feature here. And the feature is called preserve order. And if this feature is enabled, we want to depend on index map, which is a dependency. Um, yes, accept. Uh, that didn't work. So index map, and we make it normally optional. And only when preserve order is enabled as a feature, we use index map. And then here, where our value is defined, there's a B-tree map, and we can do if the feature preserve order is enabled, then we want to use index map index map as map backend. Otherwise, when this feature is not enabled, we use this as map backend, or backend map. All right, so map info is better than it. And now we just need to see where all the errors are. Um, let's do map info. Is this all we need? Looks good. Okay, so now that we change this crate, I misspelled preserve. That's very likely. Preserve. I can't spell it anyways. Um, so the nice thing is, I forked this crate now, but I can immediately start using it. This is one of the really nice features in Rust. I can say, I want to override dependencies from crates IO, which is where the default is like the Python package index. And I can say, I want to use index map from somewhere else. In my case, I want to use it from one folder up, so the value. And actually, I don't want to use index map from there. I want to use, actually, I remember the wrong thing. Um, this should not be here, this should be here. Uh, damn it. Great. I, um, I want to sort a value. I want to overwrite this from my local checkout. And now, and I want to make sure that preserve order is enabled. Cannot parse input as Tomo. Cost by 918. Yeah. Maybe missing X and create index map. Uh, in sort of value 12. Ah, yeah, because this crate here, this one here, is written in old style Rust, which means I need to do if. I need to do extend create. So let's see if this works now. No, it doesn't. Okay, there are lots of errors actually. Okay, we can do a test or features. Let's fix this over here at first. Hmm. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is that it gets a B tree map. Let's see where this is coming from. It comes in line here, for instance. What? Ah, it's here. Okay, we need the same thing here. So we do use 
map info. As in left here. Uh, pub create. So we make it public only for this create. Uh, and now we need to use this here too. So where are the errors here? Uh, map info. I could just use find to replace, um, but I did want to just check if I'm not doing anything stupid here. Okay, so index map. Um, I'm guessing very much that index map does not implement. Sorry. Oops. Index map. Where is this on GitHub? Uh, this one. It's features. Thirty one. Let's turn this on. Features is. So this turns on thirty support within index map. And I hope this fixes it. No. Expected index map found featuring map. Ah, yeah, because we have the same thing the other way too. <laughs> so now we need to do the same thing here. But for now, I'm going to just assume this is correct. This would be B tree map. And how does your place here work? Map import. That's it. Suspicious. Aha, uh -huh. okay, now we come to the hard problems. Um, this uses a custom hasher somewhere in librs2. So it says hash for value, hash the map. Hash exists, but the following trade bonds were not satisfied. Index map hash. So index map cannot be hashed. Um, okay, I guess that's fair enough. Do if feature is um, order, then we do something, otherwise, we do this. And I actually wonder how this works in sort of JSON. So let's see what they do. Because surely they have the same problem. Because sort of JSON uses index map if preserve order is enabled. Yeah, so uh, let's see what they do. Um, value. Map, let's see. Map. Hash. Hash, 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 hash. Okay, they don't implement hash. Um, I guess you can call this multiple times. Um, I hope we can call this multiple times. That's right. For key value in b dot iter hash key hash value. We can also not compare it, and you can also actually. Sorry, this is. Key hash hasher value hash hasher. 
now compare is also not implemented. Uh, or one, four, five. Um, it's a shame. Alt for partial. So they have partial EQ implemented, but no word. Doesn't matter. Um, so we do the same thing here. If we have this feature, otherwise we do this. And so what's the best way to compare in Rust a sequence? Let me try that. So what I'm building is I'm trying to build preserve order support into the sort of value library right now. That means if I deserialize an object, it doesn't destroy the order, similar to how order dict works in Python 3. Um, what's the best way to compare this? Let's see how it's implemented in Rust. Let's see, vector here implements port for vector. How is it implemented? It's implemented by these. This is annoying. Okay, that doesn't help me. How do they implement the same? How does vtreeMap implement ORT? This is a better example. ORT for vtreeMap source. Okay, we can do this. Uh, and the other one is called v2, v1, v0. Apparently this works, let's see. Yay, okay, my test pass. And the order is preserved. Now we can make a pull request. So this is, this is what works really well in uh, in Rust. So I can change the code of a dependency locally and already start using it, but I can also make a pull request. Uh, let's see, at preserve order. Um, edit support for feature equals preserve order. And make a pull request. This is actually not how to make a pull request. How do I make a pull request against um yeah actually we're gonna get up uh what's it called sort of there we go but i push this no okay this adds support for the preserve order feature that is also provided by JSON behavior is similar and comes with the same general downsides. It's a global feature. So the, the downside of this preserve feature is that once you have it enabled, it works for everything. Um, but I actually like that. So let's make a pull request and hope it's being merged. But now I can also start changing my dependency here from my local dependency to my git repo so i can say i want to use my git repository um, where is it? i need to use my git repository and i want to use this revision uh, this one here and now It will clone from my Git repository and then use this as a dependency. Neat. So this works now. Uh, so now we should also be able to transpile this into YAML. And I think YAML and Toml in Rust always preserve order. I hope so. Um, cool. So this works. Uh, let's make a commit. Initial support for code. Uh, I 
think you can also create a repo with this. Let's see, hub create. Yay. Yay, okay. Um, so obviously it's slower than Python in many ways, but I also feel a lot more comfortable in, in how it works. Because um, this is strongly typed, so highly likely this is not going to encounter any weird problems. Uh, that's my guess at least. Um, so but what I actually want to do is I want to be able to subselect into this and override values. Um, and so for that, we actually need to parse uh, a format. So what I want to do is I want to have a selector here. Let's do a selector to for filtering. So we want to, I don't know what it does here. So we make a um, pub selector is a string. And it's going to have a long and a short option. And the short one is called S, I guess. Selector. Um, this can leave. And now to parse the selector. Um, now basically what I want to do is I want to say if I write S dot foo, it only gives me bar back. Um, now how to do that best. So there's a library in Rust called pest, which I actually really like. It's this one here. And it lets you write parsers. And one of the nice things about this is that they cross compile to Wasm. So you can actually use it on their website to test grammars. So I think I might be trying to write a grammar for my, um, for my expression language here. So I probably want to have something similar to JQ. So dot selects an item, and then for every path you navigate downwards, you use dot foo or whatever. Um, and I probably want to support this. I don't know what this is. Uh, okay, so you can actually create uh, what I don't understand. How does it work? So you create. Hmm. Okay, there's a lot of more complexity in this. I don't want to go that far from the beginning. So let's start with a simple thing. So we want a root rule called uh, rule or selector. And this is going to be one or more segments. And the segment is for now just um, Oh, a good question. What am I going to call it? I'm going to call it key. And a key is a dot followed by uh, I think it's called uh, called uh, let's see. I think they have docs here somewhere. Syntax Parsing expression grammars. I want built in. Basically, I want these ones here. There's one called uh, identifier. This one. So I want dot followed by this followed by one or more continue characters. Continue. So I want selector and write dot foo. Does that parse? Okay, so that parses. Uh, really nicely, except the key now has a dot in front. So we want actually, so let's say identifier is set start and set continue. And this is followed by identifier. Uh, this seems to make more sense to me. 
So it's either going to be key or it's going to be quoted key, I guess. And quoted key is going to be this followed by, for now it's just lazy like this. So can I do test now? No, it doesn't work because why? Hmm. Um. Oh, because I don't um, this. Okay, this works. Except it doesn't handle backslash escaping and stuff, and obviously it doesn't handle most things. So this should actually be. Um. I don't know yet. <laughs> do item string item. Actually, let's do item access. Code item. I call it subscript. This is what Python calls it. Uh, so it's going to be open close this followed by either a string or an integer. So let's start with the integer, that's easier. I think there's a ready-made rule for number. Uh, or we have a string, which is just going to be, oh man, what's a string? I guess a string is anything other than, so I guess it's like this, followed by, can I say anything other than this, followed by, I don't know if that works like this in this language. So I guess it doesn't work, what does it say here? Um, how do I parse this? So a, a key or a subscript, subscript is going to be opening this and then either string or integer. Let's try just this, this should be less controversial. Okay, so this one works, this one doesn't. Um, I guess what I'm doing here just generally doesn't work. Um, does anyone know how to write? Um, what are these called? They're called... They have a name. They're called... Pegs. So how do I, how do I write parsing? So I want to parse anything other than a closing. Uh, but the good thing is I don't actually need to learn this. I can actually just see what other people do. There's a templating language in Rust called, it's a for, it's a, it's a big write of Jinja and it's called Terra. And they have a parser, which is written in Pest. So a double quoted string is like this. Let's see. I can just copy paste from other people. It's great. I love open source. Okay, so this works. So how does it work? It parses. So this makes it, I think, non-atomic. I don't know what it's called. That's yeah, the difference. I guess it doesn't matter here. So it's a quote followed by anything other than a quote, but then a character more than one followed by quote. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Um, so I can parse this now. And I guess we want this too, which is not parsable yet. And then do a full range. A full range is this, then we have uh, range, the range is 
this followed by an integer followed by this followed by an integer followed by close so if i do 1 to 10 this is now a range and then i guess i want range 2 it's going to be this range 2 and then i want range from range from is everything it's a range followed by an integer followed by this so it's from this character to something else so this should be range from cool um and i think this is all i need for now so this would be my grammar so let's make a new module called select rs uh, grammar let's make uh, grammar rs oops this wrong. Select grammar pest. Search marketplace. Yes. Is this what I want? Let's see. I guess this seems to be something exciting. Um, do you need anything else? Let's see. So is this valid? This is not valid, I guess. So we still need um, a selector is either ident or this. No, it's not called ident. It's called root. And root or it's called identity is just dot. Although I'm not sure if that's a good idea to do this, because this is different then. And it doesn't even work. I have to, I guess, do it the other way around. So this is identity, this is this. Hmm. Is this a good idea? <clears throat> I don't know if it's a good idea. I'll just leave it like this for now. So now we want pest here. Uh, so how does a pest work? I need to look at the docs again. So I want derived parser and then a grammar. Okay, let's see if this works. So use pest parser, derive parser, and it's called my called select parser, and it's grammar is path to my parser. I guess it's select um, or pest. I need to rename this. Grammar. So this one should parse now, I guess. I need to just make sure that this file exists. Cargo run. Let's see if this actually compiles. The Android grammar is currently not known to the compiler. So I guess I have to import this. No, so how does it work? Okay, I have to do this one too. Cargo add pest derive. So I guess this is what I actually want. Uh, no grammar in the root. Yeah, because I guess I don't need to have this. Okay, cool. So this compiles now. 
Um, so let's see what happens if I parse. So how does it, how do I parse? So I get a parser, which I guess is a trait. So you parse a rule on an input string. So let's do use create select select parser. Actually, let's do something else. Uh, pop fn debug parse um, select star result string error. Use failure error. I'm going to use. Okay, let's put this one down. I think I, I might be weird. I think I need to import past parser too. Let's see. Don't need to. Actually, let me try something else quickly. GitHub Rust Pest. So a lot of libraries changed their behavior with Rust 2018 to have a feature called derive to turn on derives. But this one, I guess, did not do that. But it does say unused input. OK, it doesn't matter. Let's do select parser. Parse. Uh, the rule is called selector, and I want to parse this, and I want to debug print this. Does this work? Expect enums. Ah, okay. So this works differently. So how does it work? Select parser, is there something on there? How do I select a rule? Rule type. Uh, pest arrive. Okay. Uh, I don't know how this works. So apparently I need this rule type. So where the hell do I get this rule type from? Let's see. Rule type is implemented by any T that's copy debug EQ hash and ord. Okay, there must be a tutorial somewhere. Uh docs. No, that's the wrong one. I want the book. Example. So I do this, then I derive this. So where is the rule coming from? Oh, it just makes a magic one. Okay. There's a magic variable here. Cool. Um, and I guess it's called selector. I don't like that this creates a magic rule somewhere, but OK. Um, so now that I have this, I can do debug selector parse. I'm going to rename this debug selector. I do at the end if let some selector is selector, then we're going to debug selector selector. Expected string, found string. Yes. Okay, and I need to handle the result. And we're printing it. Okay, so it parses the selector into this thing, it, into a pair. Okay, into lots of pairs. Is VS Code my primary code editor? No, my primary code editor is Vim. I'm just spending some time trying to use Visual Studio now. Uh, and only for Rust, not for Python. And only half the time. Yeah, right, I could use this debug now. Let's see. Uh, uh, 
let's see if this works. Actually, yeah. Let's do this. I have not used this crit yet, and I just updated to new Rust. So let's do return nothing and do debug here. Let's see what this does. But I think it might not indent as nicely. Oh, it does. That's cool. Yeah, I saw it in the change notes. I didn't try it yet. Okay, cool. So what can I do with this? I need to parse this into some sort of syntax tree that's a little bit closer to what I want. So I want a selector. And this should be debuggable. And it probably has a list of segments, but I'm not sure if that's actually what I want. Let's try. Elements? Maybe it's elements. No, I think it's called segment in this case. So segment is um, it's an enum. So it could be identity, which just selects the same thing. Or it's going to be key with a name. Uh, I did it with grammar. So a key. Or an index. So I guess u size is fine. It can be a range. And I can actually use the Rust range type for this. Uh, which is a range, I guess, of view size. Then we have a full range. A range, let's start with this. So, so range two is range until up to a certain index and from. Actually, I will not use the range type, I think. Uh, because I want different range semantics. So let's do range from u size to u size. Range two is u size range from is u size. Because the Python range semantics are much nicer than the Rust one. It's Rust, you have too many of them, I think. Um, so I think I will just do these. And it will work like Python ranges. Uh, what else did I root? No, these are all of them. Because key, there are two, just two formats to do this. So now we need to convert this. So let's see. This one now is um, parsed. Okay. So I think it's called pair now. And now how do I convert this? Construct is not a construct. Okay. Mm. So what I want to return is a selector. And for now, I just return an empty one. Hmm. Yes, I used the Vim plugin on VS Code. It's pretty buggy, to be honest, but it's the best Vim plugin I have found in any editor that's not Vim itself. Otherwise, I would not survive. Um, but it has its problems. So for instance, the none of the splits work like I expect. So if I do a split, it selects not the new one. I have to switch to the other one. Um, and if I try to do anything more interesting with it, it often does not do like I want. But I, I reconfigured it to be relatively close to my normal Vim setup, which is quite nice. Um, and the, the writing down here is just not so optimal. So on the bottom here, I wish it would work better. This is not anywhere close to, uh, to how Vim does it. Because if you look at my Vim normally, um, it's just way better. So um, I have, if I write down here, like it's more visible, it's like monotype. Um, 
I just I feel way more comfortable in this one. Um, but the problem is I don't have any autocompletes in there. So, um, which for Rust, I'm starting to really like sort of this IntelliSense thing. Um, and I guess at this point I should use NeoVim and the integration for, um, what's it called? The Rust language server, which I think kind of works, but um, I'm using VS Code at the moment. I will figure out, I think, how to make my Vim work with Rust better. Up to this point, I didn't ever see the need in uh, in auto completions for Rust, but now that RLS actually works really well, I I really appreciate it. Okay, but I still have no plan how to convert this. Um, so what is this? What I'm getting? So I get pairs which are nested, and I guess the syntax is always so a pair always has a rule, a span, which I guess is just the source of it. And so I can use this for debugging or error messages, and then just some stuff in it. Oh, okay, and I also have to use the span to get the raw value. So the selector here. I have to parse the span to get what I want. Okay, that's not so bad. So how do I make this best? Because I definitely don't want this recursive. I want this to be a list. So let's see, match pair. Uh, I don't know if this makes sense. Probably not. Hold on. Why do I have more than one here? I have more than one because this is... Okay, I need to try something. How does this look like if I have A, B, C, D, 42? Okay, so this is a list with A, B, C, my D, um, okay, hold on, I need to improve something here of the syntax, because I think I can remove a whole bunch of these intermediate rules that appear. So right now it tells me there's a segment with a key, and the key has an identifier in it. No, actually, I think. Uh, let me see. I think there's a way to make this. Hmm. I think you can do something to turn on and off if the rule reports by itself. So the rule prefixed with. I think it's called something like a tom. Okay. Uh, Oh no, it's an underscore makes it silent, I think. So silent. To make a silent rule, perceive the left curly brace with an underscore. So if I guess, if I make this silent, then I will never see it. Which I don't want. I think I want the key silent. So a segment? No, that does make sense because I need to know what it is. Do I need to know what it is? So one of the things of this website, like this is what I, what I think is very nice about Rust right now, and I wish other languages had that, is you can compile it into WebAssembly. So the fact that I can use the, if I can, that I can debug on the website of this project my syntax in real time is just very nice. And I wish I could have click, for instance, compile to WebAssembly and run in the click documentation. Because if you go to, um, I think it's already redirect. This documentation, I was very proud when I made it because all of these examples here in the documentation source code are tested. So if you go to the source code of this library, and you go to the docs, so for instance, the index page, uh, there's an example on here and I marked it with click example. 
And so this will create an example and this will run it as part of the documentation building process. So this output here is generated to be exactly correct according to the program here. So whenever I change the documentation, the example output also changes. But I wish I could have people edit the source code and see how it changes here. So ideally I could change the three to a four here. Um, and, and I would just write another Hellotron here. But the problem is you can't really cross compile Python into WebAssembly. It's just too, too big of a, too big of a problem to achieve this right now. Um, and nobody is doing it as far as I know, but that would be really nice. Um, this, this website I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. I can do this makes me super happy. Um, so Go also has it on their website, but the thing with the Go language is um, this one does not actually run in the browser. This one just runs it on a server, compiles it on a server, and then sends the result back. Um, so this is just running on the server, but because it compiles so fast, you don't notice it. This one literally runs in the browser. So if you, uh, if you see what it has here, there is a WebAssembly module here somewhere uh if i would know i don't know if it shows it here i don't want to reload it let me just i don't know if it ah damn it i swear with my grandma i have to put it back see i was afraid of that it doesn't persist it um yeah, there it is. This is the WebAssembly module. Um, well, you're not very useful to look at because it's just assembly code, web assembly code. Um, but it's nice. It just runs in the browser. I wonder how big this is. Uh, we should see this now. Let me force this. Uh, let's see. So it is. 160 kilobytes. It's nothing. It's 160 kilobytes. It's less than the background image, probably. Let's see. What's the background image? Uh, okay. It's an SVG, so it doesn't count. Let me see all of them. Where are they? Okay, it's the largest on this website. But if you go to if you go to any modern website, the images are going to be bigger than this, most likely. Um, so I think it's nice. Uh, but anyways, I need to figure out how I'm going to make this, which rules should be silent, which one shouldn't be. Because if I make this one silent, then I see segment identifier, which is probably not what I want. I probably want to know that it's a key. And I probably also want to know that it's an identifier here. Or maybe I don't. Maybe I can hide this. Uh, let's see. The D here is a subscript string. Yeah, I think I want to leave it like this, to be honest. Um, let's see what happens with 1 to 10. So this one is also range with... So this one I think... Ah, uh, maybe. I don't know. This is just micro optimizing, I think. Uh, I would just leave it like this. With the identifier in here. Although I do wonder if I set this up entirely incorrectly, that a key should actually be always an identifier and that multiple segments should be, no, I think it's, I think this is better this way. Makes more sense. Um, there is a Rust Python that's a volume or something like Rust, Rust Python. Yeah, I think it's like a, I think this might actually be like an implementation of Python Rust. I mean, to be honest, if someone would make a Python implementation in Rust, even if it only does like a small, 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 small subset of Python, that would be interesting. Nobody needs the whole Python. People only need a small subset. and. If you could use 
inter-process communication to call into other Pythons, that would actually be good enough to make something really interesting. Um, yeah, no one made this. That's neat. Until 100. So this is this is what I want. I, I wish Python was that. Uh, and it even has big numbers. That's pretty impressive. This is one of the better Python pseudo implementations. It's actually nice. Cool. I didn't know this exists. Oh man, if someone makes a really good implementation of of Python in Rust, man, that would be neat. That's not your name. Modules. That's what's implemented. Cool. Yeah, this 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 could have future. Honestly, maybe should, maybe should look at this. I had no idea this exists. Let's see. Let's see. How does the VM look like? Um, there's actually there's there's there are a few very interesting projects. So one of them is called Holy Jit, um, and I hope someone actively maintains this. Eh, maybe semi. So there's a, there's a project in Python called PyPy, and it's a Python implementation of Python. And the way PyPy works is that it it runs the Python code during the translation process, and it tries to figure out all the possible code paths that can logically fl float through, and it will somewhat. Actually, that, that doesn't that doesn't mm -hmm. matter to the point. But the, the actual point of PyPy is that it can auto generate a JIT for the Python language, and you could actually write another language in the underlying library that PyPy is written in that could also have an automatic JIT generated. So there's actually a project called uh, GitHub. So he called call. I think. Uh, maybe it was a secret project. Mm. I forgot what you call it. Nope, it's a different one. I forgot. We we tried to write like a small little language uh, with our Python. Um, that's not Python. But so this one here. Holy JIT also lets you auto generate a JIT, uh, JIT interpreter or just JIT out of a language. So there's an example somewhere here where they have a brain fuck um, JIT compiler. So this is this is just and this is what's really nice. Um, so you you basically say that this is the implementation of my virtual machine. So you have what you would expect. You have a loop, a program counter. You have a memory area. And this one just implements an interpreter um, that implements uh, bra um, brainfuck. So you have set my current pointer's memory address to current value minus one, plus one, and so forth. Um, and this one generates out a JIT, which I think is mighty impressive. Um, so if someone were to actively maintain this one, one could automatically, semi-automatically build a JIT for this one. Because I'm pretty sure this doesn't have a JIT right now. It's just a virtual machine. Hmm. I, I hope they don't try to be too compatible to Python. I'd rather have a better Python than a compatible Python. All the alternative Python implementations try to be so compatible to Python that I don't really find them to be a massive improvement over the standard language. If there would be like a, like a really, really cool new modern implementation of Python with just the good bits and none of the bad bits, I would, I would love this. Hmm. I will play with this. This is this is potentially exciting. MicroPython 
was never exciting to me. But but this would be nice because it could actually. I don't feel very comfortable building things in C, even though I wrote a lot of C code. Um, but whenever I write C, I either never finish the project, or when I finish it, I don't like the code that comes out at the end of it. Um, because it's very hard to write the, the opposite of Agile is C for me. So you can, like small little libraries are neat, but to write entire languages in it makes me not very comfortable. Um, yeah, I will upload the, the recording to YouTube. What are some bad, bad bits of Python? I think Python is a great language. I don't think there are necessarily big bad bits in it. It's just there's a lot of stuff that lands in a language that has not been tested properly. Primarily, it means that, like async was a good example. It just landed and it was never tested in a real project when it initially came out. So it took a very long time for that project to end up in a, um, in a state where I felt it was really good because the release cycles are very slow. And so there's a lot of stuff that has been added over the years to Python, which should have been removed already, but they can't really remove it because, um, because there's now people might use it. So for instance, um, pickle should not be there. Um, a lot of the machinery to enable the import system should not be there. The abstract base classes, a lot of the functionality or the internals of how it works should not be there. Slots should have been removed. Um, Async IO, I think, is nice, should be there, but only the modern one, only Async Await. Not, none of this coroutine business with, um, with abusing generators. Um, what else I wish I wouldn't be there? Um, a lot of the standard library shouldn't be there. Um, what else should not be there? Mm. The problem is I think most things probably shouldn't be there. I think I want just the basics. I want classes. I want a lot of the functions. I want interpreter access. I like uh, Swiss get frame. I like the trace packs, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I definitely don't appreciate um, all the things in a standard library. Like you can parse wave files, I think, uh, Python box. Um, and the problem is that people say always that, well, these are just modules in a standard library, but the problem is there is no split between standard library and language. So you can't really look at the language without a standard library. And there's some really horrible things that the language does. So for instance, if you take CPython source code, um, this is, this is, the fish stinks from the head. And I think where it stinks is, there's a, there's a, if you, if you take Python and you make a class, um, the base class of all the things in Python 3 is this object. So you can't get more basic than this. And this is called object.c here. What is it? Object.c. And you would expect that to be relatively empty. But then it does some bizarre things in it which for me violate everything that the language theoretically should have as an um, abstraction layer. So where is it? Um, what I should call, I should import uh, copy rack. Maybe actually, maybe they removed that. That would be nice. Let me see. Uh, my criticism might be highly outdated at this point. Um, Copyright. I see actually. Copyright. Uh, test copyright. Type object. Okay, so it's not an object, it's a type object, which is the class of object. Um, and it's still there. So when you call get slot names 
which let me quickly check how that works. This is used by get state. Okay, so so first what it does, um, if you call a certain API, the Python's most basic object, so the, the type of this, the type of object is type. This type will go to the standard library and it will import the copyright module. And it does it by literally calling import copyright. Copyright stir is uh, just underscore copyright. I don't know where it comes from. PyD copyright. Um, but it's, it's literally, un it's like import copyright. Uh, or copyright. Uh, actually, what is it called? Copyright. Copyright, it's called. So this module, it will import this module, which is written in Python. And it will start calling shit on it. Um, so if you, if you have a class X um, and you instantiate it, and you assign stuff to it. Um, and you call get state on it. Uh, why is this not implemented? What do I have to do for this? Get slot names. Hold on. What does it do? Slot names. Is there a slot names? No, it doesn't have slot names on it. So what does it do? It calls, um, it tries to get the slot names if it has them otherwise here. Hmm. I guess you have to define slots on it. Um, but it, it doesn't matter right now. Basically what it does, it goes into this module and calls slot names. It calls the underscore slot names function written in Python to do something on the most basic class of all because they didn't want to write it in, in C, I guess. I don't actually know why it does that, but it basically means I can't throw away the standard library because if I would throw away the standard library, then everything would break. Like a Python that does not have the copyright module cannot work in any reasonable way. And it's just one of the examples. Um, so you can't take away the standard library with the rest of the language. And I wish none of that stuff would exist. I wish it would just be the language and I could build the standard library. And I know that there are bootstrapping issues where something, sometimes you need the standard library to do something interesting. Um, but uh, there are better ways to do it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I wish, I wish none of that would exist. So this, this Python thing here done right could be very nice but only if done right anyways very far from what i wanted to do what i actually wanted to do is make this parser um is the global interpreter lock problematic in python yes of course it is can't have threats with a jill and the interpreter written is written in a way you will never be able to get rid of it so we need to have a new Python implementation without a lot of the compatibility hacks. Um, but I think like, I think Python has a really, really strong community. It has a lot of potential. I, I don't see why we couldn't try to reach for a real new language implementation. I, I think it's absolutely possible to to make a more minimal version of Rust. Um, so I want to convert this. Do we need to silence identifier? That's that's the question. Probably not. I will just leave that. Even though that means that every key has only this thing on it. Huh? to say i think i'll just leave it just make sure it's the same okay now i need to convert this so what we already figured out is that pairs come out of this uh let me run this again 
So pairs come out of this and we need to convert them all. So we know that the initial rule is always going to be one called selectors. We can do pair dot inner. So for segment pair in pair inner do something. Where's the error here? Okay, because it needs to return. Okay, selector. Uh, segments. That means segments is vector. Yeah, the obstacles are just pretty cool. I think it would not be very compatible. So the problem with Python 3 has, in my mind, never been that it was incompatible. Uh, you can make an incompatible language, and that's fine, for as long as you have an answer for how to be compatible with other stuff. Um, so for instance, Rust is not an extension to C. And it doesn't try to be C compatible in the sense that you could take some C source code and copy paste it into Rust. What you have is you have a way to call C code. So I can call a function written in C and it works. If I, if Python 3 could have been a completely different language, if I could also import Python 2 code and call a function written in Python 2, then nobody would have had any problems with Python 3 being incompatible. Um, this is how Rust works. In what I'm writing here is Rust 2018. I can import Rust 2015 code, which is incompatible um, syntax-wise, um, and I can I can I can use that. It, I can never copy paste Rust 2015 code into 2018 file and expect it to work, um, but it doesn't matter. And obviously. It's easier with a language like Rust to achieve that because there's not that much dynamic nature going on. Um, but I think it could very much be achieved to have a completely from scratch implementation of Python that's called, I don't know, Python 4000. And it ships an interpreter for Python 3 and it uses some in process communication to use some message passing to call some code there. It would obviously be slower whenever it goes through the bridge. It might incur copy pasting, serializing, whatever. But I think it's possible. And with depending on how it's set up, I think it might even be easier. Um, although I, I do understand that it's trickier to do this in Python than in Rust, uh, just by the nature of how it's set up. But I would be much more impressed by Python 3 if they would have done a major improvement of the language um, with, with good Unicode, with getting rid of craft um, and adding some bunch of stuff. Um, but they didn't do it yet. Anyways, so we want to push a new segment. And this segment is going to be called segment. Uh, let's see. So I want to match on the segment pair. Actually, do I want to match this? No, I don't, because it's always going to be a pair. So do if segment pair, uh, do match segment pair rule. And now it's, if it's a rule called uh, segment, and I guess it's always going to be a rule called segment. Hold on, hold on, how does it work? This is very confusing. What's on here? Um, so I think any segment is always going to be this. So why is this even a name? This is better. So let's start with this. So if the segment here is a rule key, then it's do segments push. So 
so sorry, if it's an identity, which I think is what we start out with, uh, identity, then we just continue and don't push. Uh, because it's the only one I don't actually want to, well, maybe I can also do segment identity. If it's a key rule, then I need to make segment key from segment pair. And it's not rule now. So rule is this span stir one for it. And I guess, okay, this works. Then we have the same thing, uh, and this needs to be two string. And if it's anything else for now, I'm just going to continue. And I wonder if this actually does what I want. Segments. It says no field inner on pair. Uh, because the pair is a list. Ha. Huh. Why is the pair list? Oh, because it's an iterator. Hmm. Okay, hold on. What happens if I make an empty? Just try this. So we debug the pairs. This is actually really nice. I can do this. Um, segments rarely used here after move. Okay, this is not nice. Debug should automatically reference. This is stupid. Um, okay, so what happens if I make an empty string here? Gives me nothing because it can't match this. Okay, so it will always be one pair, I guess. That's what it means. Um, next, unwrap. So I should only get one pair, that's correct. Okay. So then I can remove this code again. Does this work now? Unknown field. No field on iterators pair pair. Mm. Uh, should Python 3 have removed significant white space and include strong typing? I think it have it should have absolutely include strong typing optionally, same way as TypeScript does it. But I don't think it was obvious at the time they started working on Python 3. The significant white space, I don't have a problem with. I liked it. Um, no variant key. Because it's lowercase key. But why is there no inner on it? For a segment pair in debug pair. Oh, actually, I wonder if this works. To disable it. I wonder if there's just a way to disable code at all. Maybe run cargo doc to see what type splash match generates. Yes, let's do this. Hmm. While this builds the documentation, uh, actually, I need to do something else. I need to see. I want to build the documentation without dependencies, but with private items. So with private items, no depths. That's what I want. What made me start learning Rust, I found it very interesting and I could use it with Python. I mean, I like doing a lot of Rust now, but I think the vast majority of the code that I write is still Python. And so all of all of the new things for Sentry that the team that I lead in Vienna builds are written in Rust. So we have, for instance, a library called Semaphore. And this one is there's a library in there called general and all of this library is written in rust this implements the entire protocol of sentry and so for instance if you look at this this is for instance what a stack trace looks like and there's a lot of 
dealing with this data in. And we expose this library to C. Uh, so this is, this is what the library looks like for C. So this is all written in Rust, but all of these functions are exported to C. And we then have a Python module, which calls out to the C layer. And so if we take our Sentry project here, I can import lib semaphore and I can do something here. I can, for instance, call, I don't know, what can I do here? I can, for instance, call uh, Why well, I can't find this call this method here, which is not very impressive. From it. From semaphore. Okay, it's called semaphore. And and so I can. This calls Rust code. Um, and. Before Rust, the only languages you could do this with without any major downsides were C and C++. Um, and so that was one of the reasons I really like Rust. Because we can use it in Python. We have a lot of Rust code in Python. If you if you send any JavaScript event into a Sentry installation, you go through a lot of Rust code. Um, anyways, let's see what we get here. So we get the rule of these variants. Um, and then we get, hold on, that makes no sense though. So we still wanted this pair. Where does the pair come from? So the pair must come from pest itself. Do we have pest here? So there must be a pair in there. Except there is none. Pair. So a pair. What the hell? Ah, okay. So I can see it, but I can't access it. So the only way for me to access this is to call. S stir on it. Okay, so hold on. How do I iterate over it? I iterate over it by calling into inner. Heh, I don't understand this. Let's go to the docs. Uh, pest docs. I had them open somewhere here. Pest RS book. Um, syntax are built in rows. Something here. Okay, so that was an example. So how do I deal with this? So I get uh, so called inner. Uh, okay, I guess I'm supposed to do this. Um, for for record in. No, it's actually. Not Never mind. I will just leave this for now. But I will do into inner for a second. I guess it's called second pair. And then do second pair as rule, and this will return this. And then here I can do. Let's, I think here I can do s stir to string. Let's see if this works. Does this work? I did something wrong. Also, I just started doing this in the wrong editor. Um, so where is the... So, this is what I wanted. Okay, so this works. I get the keys. 
Now I need the other one. So there's a key we established. Then we have um, key or subscript. So let's start with subscript. Subscript is more complex now. We need to look into the inner rule to figure out if it's a string or an integer. So let's do match pair dot to inner. to inner next or not i don't know if this works like this but i'm assuming it does oh. mm. learning on the shop here um. so if i have a rule if i have a pair so I can get the rule, I can get the string, I can get the span, which I don't need right now. I can get the inner pairs and I can get tokens. I guess, what do I want? So subscript, this is this one here. I want to get, yeah, I want to get the inner ones, but I know there's only going to be always one. So I can do unwrap. Make sort of patterns. It's not empty. Yeah. So now I do. If it's a rule, uh, or if it's a rule integer, then actually I need to do this. So let some script. Is this? So we do match subscript rule as rule. If it's an integer, <clears throat> then I do segment index uh, subscript rule as stir parse unwrap. This can never fail. If it's a um, quoted string, I guess it's the other one. Let's see. So it can be <clears throat> a string a string then it's segment key of for now subscript rule as stir one two <clears throat> okay this this is the part why i don't like Just subscript rule as stir so i want from one to the length of the string minus one to string and we need to also remove slashes but we'll not do that for now and all the rest should never happen so i guess i get subscripts now let's see um except i have an index here i should pair value moved here in previous situation um <clears throat> See, this is where Rust is awesome because it just told me about me using the wrong variable. So I get A, B, C, D, 42. <clears throat> this looks good. And if I do just a dot, I get that entity. And I will actually change this by saying that if it's identity, I will do nothing. Okay, so what else do we have? We have ranges. <clears throat> so we can't handle this one yet for instance so let's see how ranges work um, the first one is a range let's make a full range it's the easiest full range so full range is just a segment full range if we get a range then it's going to be what does it complain here okay. it doesn't like that I have a rule here that doesn't do anything yet so let's try this so this works now we want everything up to an index 
so range two and now we need to do the same thing as here um which is so range two how does it look like range two looks like this so it has one integer in it yes the video will be saved what are my thoughts on memory management rust uh it's super easy honestly R memory management in rust is is not hard like this is a language with garbage collection and so far you haven't seen me at all in any way touch any memory allocation it just works so it's really convenient um i think it's there were some very clever people that built this so i want to build a range two with I guess for the range two, I could simplify this by saying, can I do this? No, I don't want to say, I will do subscript, no, hold on, segment pair, I don't let in, uh, int rule is the same thing as here. I will say this is the int, like parse int int rule. I think there might be a better way to do this. Int rule. Uh, actually, I don't even have to do this complicated. I can just do int rule as stir parse unwrap. And put this here. So this should be enough to do the parse too. And the range two, and then we have range from, which is exactly the same. And I could actually do something nice. I can do a rule range from, and then I do let value is this part here minus this. Um, ah. Sometimes this doesn't do what I want. Actually, I will, I'm lazy. I'll do this like this. And then we want a full range, which is. Uh, I can do. Uh, map x as stir parse and wrap. And say range and rule next unwrap. I think this should work. And from one to two. This rule makes no sense, but it should still, yeah, it works. Okay, so neat, this works. Um, I have a selector. But I would need to actually do something useful with it. Um, let's see. What could I do with this now? So let's remove this first. Debug. <clears throat> I think this is the entire syntax handled. Um, this should now be unreachable. Let's make sure. Last one is range from range, full range, range. Let's do the same order as the other one. Okay, so this is everything handled. The only to do is I need to remove the backslashes, which I wonder if there's a good way to do this. Um, rest backslash is on escape. Maybe there's something built in. Mm. Let's see. Line feet on escape. 
strip slashes. Ah, uh, stock store. I wonder if there's already something built in. I know there's some built into um, into Python that removes backslashes. Uh, escape. So you can add apparently. Let's see if there's a crate. And escape. Unescape strings with escape sequence written as literal characters. Three years ago, it doesn't seem very maintained. Hmm. Okay, I'll just do it manually. Um, so we're going to go over all the characters and we do something with it. Filter map seems good, although I don't know if I can actually do that. What a convenient way to do this. I would need to go over all the characters and whenever I see a backslash, I will ignore it unless the other last one was also a backslash. Hmm. I'm pretty sure filter map. Let's see. Filter map is. What am I doing? I'm trying to parse JQ query syntax to then modify JSON or YAML documents. Filter map. Uh, so the function is an f and mod, which is good. So I want that. So we can do this. That mod was backslash is false. So we do the character. If we match the character, if it's um, yeah, I think it's this. If it's a backslash, and the last one was a backslash, then we return a backslash. Otherwise, if it was not a backslash, was. Uh, Um, how to do this best? Um, uh, okay, let's do it differently. Um, if it was not a backslash, then we don't do anything, but we say that it was a backslash. And in this case, we return it. Otherwise, we do v equals this was backslash is false sum rv, and then we collect this into a string. Oops. Does this do what I want? Uh, ah, yeah, because any other character we want. So let's see. So when I do this, this, I get, uh, it might just be shell syntax now. Let's try this one. Oh, and actually, hold on, that should work. If I do, hmm. So if it was a backslash, I hate this. Let me do this differently. I can't read this. If it was a backslash, it was not a backslash. Then I return none. And I say it was a backslash. In all other cases, I return the backslash. Actually, I don't even need to do this complicated. I can literally do this. Ah! Editor. Okay, 
But it doesn't do what I want. Let's try this. Debug C. So what do we get here? Expected one off. Yes, I went to exclamation mark. So I get D backslash backslash E and I get only one. Ah, okay, yeah, because this is the backslash that's being added by the debug output. So it does actually do what I want. It's just very confusing. Um, so this removes the backslashes. Am I unescaping chasing string? Uh, yeah, but I only want to do the single backslash. I don't want to do any of the other escapes. Uh, but it's good to know that I could, yeah, I guess I could use form stir in this case. Yeah, I'm too lazy. All right, this is fine now. I already did this. Um, what else might I want from JQ syntax? So I don't think I want any of these complicated things for now. So what does the question mark do? I wonder if this actually works in JQ. Let me see. Yeah, kind of this. This gives the first item. This gives you everything up to the first, to the second. Can you do negative number? Ah, this reminds me. So I do want negative numbers, which means I need to change my syntax to also support an optional negative thing here. So I can do this. And this in turn means I cannot use u size. I have to use size. Uh, I think what i size. Oh, but... And I might just make it a 32 bit integer. This seems to make more sense to me. And because I didn't write u size anywhere down here, it still works. So let's if I do minus two. It works incorrectly why oh because i didn't <laughs> so this is actually a problem it does not give me an error if it encounters a parsing error um so i need to find a solution for this okay but it gives me minus two here now okay so what do i do about the garbage at the end why do I not get an error here? So this here just doesn't do anything. So I guess I need to see if there is some crap left at the end. Let's see. Let, let's do this. Let pairs. Let pair is pairs. Next and wrap. Um, let's see what is left in pairs, I guess. Connect into a vector. Nothing. Okay, so it does do something with my string. The perfect Nuitika. I don't know what Nuitika is. It's a good replacement for the pattern that requires every construct. Uh... I mean, it sounds like not the worst idea in the world, but the problem, so it seems like it compiles Python bytecode into C code and then links all of this against libpython. Sounds like a good idea, but the problem is like all of the attempts that people made in the past with this have been islands. So someone made it somewhere and it was only compatible with a part of the ecosystem. And 
I think what needs to be done is that a lot of this supporting code needs to live in Python itself. So that tools like this would not be this incompatible. Boy, it sounds like a good idea. Would be worth trying. But like all of these distributable Python things had so many downsides. I because like there's a lot of code that just opens files, and so if the files are not there, uh, it's a good idea though. Okay, so what does has to do with the rest of the input. So if I parse parser state, I don't fully understand this. So I get a parser, but evidently I never get an error, which I guess makes sense. Hmm. Maybe there's something in the iterator. So this is an iterator. And I guess... I don't know. I mean, like, obviously there's a simple way to do this. I could just say... I could do... If pair length is smaller than select length, turn air. For now, I'm going to be lazy and just use these. I need to make proper error types later. Um, garbage after selector. Um, Okay, so this one fails now if there's something at the end. What's the data look like before you match on it? So before I match on this, it looks like here. It's basically a list of pairs where each pair has a rule, which is what the grammar is written in. Uh, what the what the what the grammar represents the span of the string that it is from where to where it goes um and i could actually use this instead uh, and then a list of other int interior pairs and it does this recursively and it's actually easier to look at here but i do wonder because this one here gives me, I don't know, that might just be something else. Anyways, this works now. So what I want to do now, I want to use these segments to match on my value. I don't know if I will actually do this now. Um, I think I might actually want to clean up this a little bit first. So let's make an error. Pop in on select the parse error. Um, garbage. Garbage at the end of the string of the selector. Um, And I promise I actually want to carry the location information. Or do I? Man, I might actually be very lazy here. Let's see. So let's return a selected parse error instead. 
So return error, select a parse error garbage. And this one, actually, I wonder what happens if I write some stupid things into GQ. So this obviously is valid, but I know it's, huh, okay, so this is what errors look like. Hmm. Okay, anyways, it complains that it can't convert past errors, so that's fine. So let's implement past errors. Um, so what do they look like? There's a variant, a location, and a line column. Um, what is this? Line, collection, location. Possession, position, or span. And this one is also position or span. Move path. Um, let's see. <laughs> Move from span with path. We need rules. It's all private. I don't want to handle all of these. I would just do this simple thing. I would just say there's an invalid syntax with a string. Invalid selector. Oops. And when an error happens here, I'm going to say it's a selector parse error invalid syntax to a string. Which is not what I really want, but probably good enough. So if I write this here, it says, ah, interesting. Hmm. This does not actually give me errors. Why? This is confusing. Why do I not get an error? It's very, very confusing. Did I do something wrong when I wrote my syntax? This should not be valid syntax. But for some reason, It doesn't give me an error. What, what else do I need to do? Uh, example. Aha, uh -huh. I think I need to do this. I think this is end of input. So let's see. I probably need to say... Hmm. Yeah, it probably has to be selector followed by end of input. And this probably has to be start of input. But now... Surely I can do this 
somehow else. I don't want to see this, so how do I not see this? Okay, probably, hold on, I'm probably doing this wrong. I want start of input followed by this followed by end of input. If I write crap here, it fails. Okay, this is what I want. But why is this... How do I make it so that I don't see it in the input? Um, I don't want to know about it, but I guess I can't do this, can I? Um, 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 um. Predicates? No? How do I make something silent? So I can only make the whole rule silent. But I guess I can't do this, can I? This doesn't mean anything. So I got to end is silent. End of input. Does that do something? No. I guess I can't do this. It doesn't matter. So let's do let's do this. And if I see end of input, I just do nothing. So now I should get an error. Invalid selector. Which I guess is good enough for now. And this works. Okay, this also means I can remove this thing here. Which means I can move this here. Which in turn means I can probably remove a whole bunch of stuff. So if I do this, it fails. Because it needs. Okay. Um, I just don't like that my error is just a string now. But I guess I'm too lazy to convert this error now. Well, maybe maybe it's not so hard. Let's see. So I want to. Oops. So let's see what we can do with this. Um, if e dot. What's e? E is a past error. I wonder if Pest is actually Hungarian and supposed to be pronounced Pest. Uh, why is it error? So it has a variant and location. And I guess it can convert this to a string. Display. Display. No need debug. Okay, let's see. There must be FMT display for error and format so format does a lot okay anyways I can do this I can just return a new type for now I can say this is just a wrapper around Test error error of that's a good question. What is this? Error of R. R is rule type. Error of the rule. Is it this what I return? Um and then I just do this. Okay, so let's do Fail display is like this. This is just a new tab now. So at least I have my custom error now without leaking out this one. Uh, and I'm too lazy to reformat this now. But what I do want to do is I want to have an implementation on this 
select the parse error, which returns the location, which returns the size returns the column of the error. So I do a match over me self and do if it's a dot error dot. Uh, Why do I have two? Location with the input string, line column with the input string. I guess it doesn't matter because I only have one line. Let's do dot location. So if it's a pest error input location. What, what, what the hell is new from post? is Ugh, this seems to be very weird so there's a position and what does this mean My input location uh, doesn't mean anything apparently New from import parsing error position position from start input. From start. Uh, maybe line call location makes more sense. Line column pair. Okay, this makes more sense. Let's do this one. Line, what do you call it? It's called line call. Line column location. Was, and I guess it's. I don't care about the line. I care about the column. Turn the column, and if it's a span, then I will return the initial one. Except. Turn the column of where the error occurred. And then I guess we want the error message. Turn the error message. But this is the question how do we get the error message? I don't think we can get the error message. Because the error message would be somewhere in here. Giant parsing errors expected and unexpected rules. Positive attempts, negative attempts, custom error, message. And there's nothing on there which gives me the message. Ugh. Annoying. I wish people would spend as much time and effort into making error APIs work as nice as the success APIs. Because like errors is what people want to consume at the end of the day as well. Um, So the thing is, it's actually relatively easy to debug all of this with Rust because I can just go to the docs and see the source code right there too. Uh, but I wish it would be easier. So they do this thing where they... Mm. Oh, great. There's a message function, but it's private. GitHub hashed. Mm. Error message. Mm. Error message. Error message. Improved documentation. Error message. Cleared. I think I would like to send a pull request which makes some variation of this public. But I don't know if that's in the interest of the developers it's to make error message accessible. 
that's not. Hmm. Okay, the error message function. Function is quiet. To expose custom errors from hashed it seems. This for to be about making it public and return a message a object that implements mt format uh, display yeah because if I could if I could call this, it would be way easier. I'm just too lazy to do this now. I'm just going to keep this here. Uh, and I'll say allow unused for now. So it doesn't warn me. Just going to keep this error for now. Um, but I definitely want my custom error at one point. Uh, That basic select parser. I mean, it's not very fast doing this if you have no idea what you're doing, but I think Pest is one of my more favorite parsing solutions, even though it's the first time I actually used it. I only played with this website before. But this is, it seems relatively well thought through. Definitely. We'll do it again. Um, so I think what I will do going forward is I will actually implement this so that it can subselect like JQ can into a JSON object or YAML object or something like this. And then I'm also going to expose, I'm going to compile this into C library and I'm going to make a Python binding for it so we can use this from Python and from um, and from Rust. But I definitely want to, at the end of the day, be able to uh, format this nicely out. Um, but we're still a little bit off there. And I also want to be able to syntax highlight this uh, on, the, on the shell when it spits it out and send it out instead of doing it on into a file. Um, but I think I will leave it with this for today and I will try to upload this recording to YouTube. All right. Thanks for tuning in.